Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the San Diego Latino Film Festival. We're celebrating our 27th edition virtually via the event of platform. We're approaching the end of this year's edition. Uh, it wraps up tomorrow, Sunday, September 27th. That means there's still time for you to visit our uh, event of website and watch movies all day tomorrow if you'd like. Thank you for all of those who have not only participated by watching films, but also participated in the Q and A's, which are very, very meaningful to us as a festival because it allows us to connect with the filmmakers. But these Q and A's also provide a lot of context and information that as a viewer, you'd, you know, you'd definitely be interested in. Um, on behalf of everyone on staff, I'd like to thank everyone for being so appreciative, uh, sorry, so understanding. We are appreciative, so understanding of the transition from an in-person event to a virtual one. We were planning on having the festival back in March, uh, but life got in the way. And now here we are bringing you this edition virtually. Um, so for today's post-screening discussion of Fandango at the Wall, we have a full house of special guests. I'm very excited to chat with them and I'm even more excited to hear what they have to say about the film. So I'm gonna bring them on screen one by one, we have the director, Varda Barkar. Hi, Varda. Hi, good to be here. Welcome back to the stream. We talked to you earlier today during our Meet the Filmmaker session. Thank, Thank you for you. making time in your schedule for a second uh, StreamYard experience with us. With pleasure. It's great to be here. And thank you for having me and us and Fandango at the Wall at the festival. Oh, it's a pleasure. Next up, we have. Kabir Segal, producer. And if you saw the documentary, he was one of the protagonists. Kabir, how are you? I'm great. It's great to be here um, with my fellow protagonists. So I think they'll be joining us. So the, yeah. the, whole, the whole band is coming here. Uh, th <laughs> thanks for having us as part of your August festival. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to be reforming the band virtually. Here comes the next member, Arturo O'Farrell, creator of uh, the Afro Latin Jazz Orchestra. Arturo, how are you? Oh, you got to unmute yourself. I'm good. I'm good. I'm actually really, really, really cool. How are you? Doing well. Really happy to be here. Um, happy to be here. Happy to be here. Well, I'm, in I'm, I'm in Brooklyn. I'm in the it's people a little late. Republic of Brooklyn. No, no. It's, this is early for a Latino musician. In fact, if, oh, if so things late. were normal, I'd probably be leaving for a gig in the next hour or two. <laughs> well, this is your gig. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's introduce the last member of the band, Jorge Francisco Castillo, founder of Fandango Fronterizo. How, how are you, Jorge? Good, Moses. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you uh, in person, finally. <laughs> yeah, it's, always, email. it's great to put uh, faces to email handles, finally. <laughs> um, so this platform is, for everyone watching or listening, this platform is very interactive. Just type out any comments or questions you might have for our guests, and I'll make sure to throw them on screen so that they have a chance to answer questions or give you feedback on any particular comment that you have. You can do that via the event of platform or through our social media channels on the San Diego Latino Film Festival Facebook and YouTube pages. Well, let's not waste another moment. Let's do a dive into Fandango at the Wall. Um, generally speaking, what is it about this border concert at this at the Wall that makes it so ripe for a cinematic interpretation? Whoever wants to go, Bardo or I, I can I can tell you right off the. I mean, I'm yeah. a big fan of of cinema. I'm a big fan of Fellini and uh beautiful imagery and beautiful sounds and beautiful people always make for good cinema 
and in particular when it's a, a celebration of life and community and this movie is 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 it's a huge celebration you cannot watch this movie without hearing uh joy without seeing community without uh feeling a sense of hope and so you know i think uh this this is a perfect example of a movie uh, uh that, 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 that contributes to our lives varda anyone else have anything else to add varda share with us okay so can you repeat the question one more time what makes this yeah. a cinematic subject is that the yeah it's a well yeah this concert what makes it ripe for cinematic uh treatment i i, I should say well, it's, I think it's the, the context, you know, it's, it's the alchemy of what happens at the festival against the backdrop of the reality that we live in. And I think it's, you know, it's the, there's also the circus aspect of it that, you know, you were talking about Arturo, you know, the orchestra and the sonorato musicians, it's the music, it's the gorgeous, you know, landscape of Veracruz, the world of Veracruz, you know, that has not been revealed, you know, in the way that we do at least. And it's it's the drama of the border, that that border wall, and it's the tension between the two sides. So there's a lot of, and it's interesting people and the most brilliant, you know, musicians. Um, and so there's a lot of elements that come together, I think, to create an exquisite cinematic experience. One thing I could- Anyone else? I, yeah, could, I could add that um, uh, Mexico is going through uh, hard times uh, with the, you know, the drugs and, and violence and um, women disappearing. So that's all you hear on the news um, and uh, sometimes on films too, drug dealing and all that. So to have a different picture of Mexico, to have a different uh, way to talk about Mexico. I think it's it's great to have this film to share something different with the community, with the world about Mexico, yeah. And then Jorge, how long have you been doing the concerts uh, at, at the border through the mm -hmm. Fandango Fronterizo Initiative? It's been done 13 years in a row. Um, this past, I mean, this 2020, 2020 it's, um, was virtual because of the pandemic, but um, we had it on online. But um, physically at the border, 12 years and one year virtually. Thanks for sharing. Um, and then Kabir, as a producer, uh, or what, what, what the producer, what was it that attracted you to this project? We obviously see in the documentary that you know Arturo, obviously, and Jorge, Jorge, but what was it about you? What was about this that motivated you into producing the film? I think it was the uh, dramatic juxtaposition of things that usually don't go together. Um, and so when you hear uh, music, you think, love, harmony, alegria. When you hear wall, you hear the opposite of that. So it's really the juxtaposition of things that really don't belong, but in some amazing way, Varda through the cinematic arts has been able to kind of deconstruct the wall or fell the wall or raise the wall. And so um, I'm a big um, believer in arts and advocacy. And um, you can write op-eds, you can you know try to get uh, policy done, but it's really through the heart and minds you can touch, uh, you can use music to touch the hearts and minds. So this seemed like an opportunity to not just um, read the news that was happening or respond to the news, but to make the news and to drive the conversation as it relates to immigration and immigration policy in the in, in the United States. And so, and vis-a-vis -vis Mexico. And for the first, I mean, the film just came out, but we're already starting to hear feedback like, there's a, di a different narrative that you know it's not just about building the wall it's about there's actually people here who want to um deconstruct it and or in in, in a metaphorical way so I, it's just the drama of these two things together and um i really i would really like uh, maybe i'm jumping ahead i would really like for um people to see this and to, to there to be a, a conversation about sensible sane immigration policy in our country Thank you, Kabir. Um, Varda, if you had a artistic statement as a documentarian or a message that you want to convey through through your films, how did you apply 
your own thesis on filmmaking to this particular documentary? Well, it might be, you know, because I've struggled a lot um, you know, in my childhood. I don't know why, but I really like to create work that speaks into possibility. I really like to, to kind of look at, you know, what the struggles are, what the obstacles are, but in a way that comes to some kind of greater understanding and that leaves leaves the audience and leaves us all feeling like, you know, we we can engage in the world, that there's hope, that there's a future. So I like to really speak into possibility. And I think that that's something that I bring to all my work. Um, and um, also, you know, I, I'm very, I would, I love, you know, artistry. I, I bring, you know, I like to bring, you know, certain rigor around, you know, all the aspects of the film, the color, the sound, the framing, the use of camera movements, you know, all of the different, you know, elements that come together to tell a story, um, you know, as well as to, to reveal our subject, you know, in an honest and authentic way and to be very respectful of them. I think, you know, when we're making documentaries, we, we have a certain responsibility. You know, we're, these are real people, these are their lives. And, you know, I feel a great responsibility to treat my subjects, you know, respectfully and to reveal them, you know, as, as honestly as I can, but in a way that, you know, respects who they are. And it, I, so I'm you know, I would never be interested in exploiting or taking advantage of someone or to like, you know, pull something over on someone or anything like that, you know, just very transparent filmmaking. Um, everyone knows, you know, what's going on. Everyone can, can feel that they trust me as a filmmaker when I'm doing documentary work. Thank you, Varda. And I think I'd like to apply that question to the other artists in the room, which is everyone. Everyone, uh, I guess. Do you have a thesis as a, as musicians that you wanted to make sure that was felt impactfully through this documentary? Arturo, I can call on Arturo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think um, that so much of what we sectionalize and nationalize and call uh, Mexican music or American jazz or those things are the products of so many people. And and for me, the most beautiful thing about Fandango Fronterizo is that it's as, as Mexican an expression of art as you can get, yet the componentry of it is clearly African, clearly European and clearly New World. The rhythms that the Haranas play, the way they interlock, reflect uh, what we call Afro-Mexican influence. The, 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 the song forms uh, are born out of uh, Spanish seguidillas. The, uh, the art, the incredible art that Fernando Guadarrama applies is, is, is tra trova, straight, up and simple. Uh, pregón, improvisation, and all of it filtered to the beautiful, beautiful people of Veracruz. And so it becomes something that is from many places at once, and yet it's very uniquely Veracruz and Mexico. And, and to me, that's beautiful because that's what I think jazz is. That's what I think Mozart does in his operas. When Mozart wrote his operas, they were full of Italian, French, and German influence. And I think when you try to sectionalize uh, and you try to fix yourself on this finite point artistically and culturally, you're doing a disservice to the continuum that is called art. And and my God, how beautiful is Son Rocho. It is, it is full of the riches of the world, and it is exclusively part of the tradition of Son Rocho, of Veracruz. It's, it, and to me, that's an example of what art does and what it is. Kabir, Jorge, do you have anything to add? Uh, I would say that, you know, Fandango the Wall is a, um, when I think about the artistic statement, I think we really focus on storytelling. At the end of the day, this is a, um, a documentary, feature doc documentary, and we always wanted to dream big with this. And I think by you dream big by, not by thinking small, but by like focusing on the most 
moving and, and salient aspects of a story. And I think nailing that down from a narrator perspective is really critical to um, to getting to know the portraits of the artists before the culminating uh, shots. So like the music takes on a heavier weight because you get to know the characters. And, you know, Varda was um, so great at, at um, sort of through the moving, moving images on the screen, painting these portraits. So I hope when people watch this film, um, Fandango at the Wall, um, that's what people take away. That's the artistic statement. We, I mean, we made an album. This, uh, you know, Artur made an album that's with the same name. But when it came to the film, it was about the storytelling and getting those portrayals down. And um, and it was the great folks at HBO when they saw the film. I think that's what really moved them, um, and uh, and uh, enabled them to put it on their streaming platform and broadcast it because they're like it's about the, the storytelling. So that's why um, that that would be our that was a focus of of, of all of ours initially. Jorge, what do you think? Um, well, I think it's uh, really um, nice to see that, that this, um, the people can, um, the people that don't know much about the fandangos and what the music from Veracruz is and what it's uh, a fandango where people get together to celebrate uh, that everybody's included, that everybody's welcome. And, and and especially having it uh, at the border where you think that it cannot be done and all of a sudden you see this celebra this huge celebration of life and love and friendship. Uh, even through the wall, you can see the music going back and forth. Nothing can stop music. So this is really a, a wonderful message um, and being able to connect it with Veracruz and with um, uh, Tijuana and then go to New York and, and share all this to the world. I think it's a, it's a great uh, opportunity to send this message and uh, we print, I'm pretty sure that, I, well, I hope that people after watching the film, they all agree with me that we need more Fandangos in this world. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to add one other thing that actually is very important um, from the creative perspective is to add to what everybody said, which is so beautiful. I feel so lucky because I, you know, I have such an articulate team that you know, I don't really need to say much. I can just listen to what they say and it's enough. Well, um, but I do want to say that I also really want, you know, wanted in the making of the film to have the audience join us, to be very inviting and to create the structure and to create the film. So you're, you know, you're coming along with us and you're, you're learning as we're learning and you're having these you know, experiences as we're having them and sort of to build it and that you're kind of coming along and discovering as we're discovering to, to give the, you, you know, an immersive experience and to have you kind of envelop you and have you be part of the experience. And so that is something that, you know, I worked hard to, to do. If I may add something real quick to what Varda just said, I, well, I, I think uh, uh, I was just saying that Fandangos are a celebration uh, that brings people together. And I think what Varda did with this film is um, when you watch it, you, it makes you feel part of it. It makes you feel like you're in, it, you're in, the, in the film. And it's the same thing that happens in a Fandango. Yeah. So that's, that's, I think, uh, a great job on Varda's side. Thank you, Varda, for for that. I think uh, you always express that that you that was your your idea, but I really feel it when I see it. So that's great. And 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 I have heard many comments from people that had watched the film said, "I feel like I'm in the film, and and I want to watch more and more and more." So that's that's great. <laughs> Thank you all for contributing. We have our first question from a viewer. Okay, uh, Manuel Cruces Camberos. The question is, uh, who came up with the idea to combine the Fandango from Teriso with Latin jazz, and what is the message that you want to express with this project? Arturo, take that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think the words Latin jazz are simplistic, like saying uh, Fandango or uh, Son Jarocho. 
it's it's no one writes the textbook for what Latin jazz is. Latin jazz is from Cuba, it's from Mexico, it's from Colombia, it's Afro-Peruvian, it's Afro-Andean. What people call Latin jazz, they simplify it down to kind of mean montunos and bongos and congas, and it really is so much richer than that. And to me, that's the thing that I learned from Son Jarocho. This is a, a, a so many rhythms and so many different influences in Son Jarocho that it seemed to me reflective of the respect and love we have for Son Jarocho to mix our music with it, to mix Afro-Latin jazz. And that's a different thing. That's a very different thing. We're talking about Puerto Rico and Colombia and Spain and Paraguay and Europe. You know, we're talking about a whole big, big, big in, entire world. And to me, again, I said this earlier, but that's what Son Jarocho teaches us. Son Jarocho teaches us that this is, we are part of one another. And that's why it's so welcoming. That's why what Jorge does with his musicians at the border invites everyone to participate freely. So I don't I don't make the distinction between Latin jazz and Son Jarocho, but I appreciate themselves, their differences without diluting either one. If I may add something to what Arturo just said, uh, to, Great question, Manuel. Thank you for asking that. I think it's a uh, one thing that happened is when when this idea came from Arturo and Kabir, which uh, read the article in New York in the New York Times, and they saw this uh, possibility and the the you know the vision. They had the vision to um, to join. I mean, to make these two genres meet at the border and. When I heard about it, um, I was I was really thrilled because uh, Son Jarocho has a lot of improvisation, very rich in improvisation, and jazz does the same thing. So when I figure, well, what what a most perfect um, marry dash to have the two the two genres together and experience, and I was really happy to to receive that request from Arturo and Kabir and and um, but they're 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 responsible for bringing this <laughs> Arturo and Kabir, and they're very welcome. I was I was really happy to hear that. I hope that answers your question. Well, I'm kind of curious. Uh, well, three of you actually. What what was your, you know, when it came to you, and you thought, let's do this, right? What were you hoping? Like, did you have a sense of where they would all lead? Was there like a vision of? what would come of it when you got so excited about doing it? Well, I mean, I, I have a, you know, it's funny because, I mean, I've had the privilege of playing with the Abichuelas in Spain, with Boom Diwan in Kuwait. And, and I've had the privilege of learning that we don't teach people how to swing. Uh, I've had the privilege of learning that uh, the cultures that we visit have much to teach us about improvisation, about swing, about the language of harmony. And so when we walk into a courtyard in uh, Veracruz or a living room in Kuwait, we're not there to teach. We're there to learn, we're there to experience, we're there to share. And at the end, the final process is we recognize one another in each other. I'll tell you a really, really quick story. I'm sorry, I don't wanna take a lot, a lot of time, but we were in uh, Kuwait and we had, a, Puerto Rican and a Cuban percussionist uh, sitting in with a, a bunch of Kuwaiti pearl diving fishermen uh, 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 percussionists, and they started jamming. And the, they all of a sudden started looking at each other and going, yo, where'd you learn that? That's Bomba from Puerto Rico. And then the, the Kuwaiti percussionists were looking at our guys going, where'd you learn that? That's our music from, 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 from Fujeda. And all of a sudden, they recognized in each other that the music they were playing was somehow being rediscovered. We weren't building bridges. We were discovering bridges. And I find that when I play with my friends in Veracruz, I'm experiencing my roots as a Cuban. I'm experiencing my roots as a Mexican. I'm experiencing my roots in so many different ways. So the rediscovering each other is, I think, what the journey of music is all about. You know, and that's, what I've, that's what I've experienced as a musician. I don't. I think our we we just wanted to create. And uh, when you asked what did Fandango the Wall was really, um, we all kind of 
when we decided to do it, we went to our corners of what we what we do as artists, Arturo is a musician. So he says, let's, let's do an album. Um, I'm a I'm a writer, so I wrote a book on this project. But I was like, there's something we need to do something bigger because Jorge ha ha has a you know he's very tall, casts a big shadow. I don't think an album and a book is sufficient to capture the giant um, this of Jorge. So we we need a we need a film. And how do we find how do we um, find a filmmaker? So we kind of put it out into the world, and through um, you know Esperanza, Varda came into our lives and created this. I had no idea it was going to turn into something so uh, gorgeous and exquisite. This was just kind of a, you know, we just put it out into the world. And so I also think that's good when you create without the expectation of like trying to create something amazing. You just kind of solve one thing at a time. And, and then there comes a synchronicity to the project. And next thing you know, you're on the San Diego Latino Film Festival, virtual festival with, with Moises coming to you live around the world. What's better than that? <laughs> Nothing better than that. <laughs> um, we have more questions coming in if we can uh, get to these. So let's see. Uh, Donato Cabrero is asking uh, Son Jarocho is so uniquely Veracruzano. However, is there a historical connection with Son Cubano? Absolutely. Anyone? Absolutely. <laughs> I can say something, um, um, or Arturo, you want to take it? First, no, go ahead, bro. I'll, 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 okay. I'll, 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 I'll wait for you. Okay. Um, I, I think, uh, um, what I know about this is that, um, Son Cubano came to Veracruz and then people start playing music in Veracruz and they're saying, This is Son Jarocho. It's like, uh, like if I start playing, um, uh, son in in Tijuana in San Diego and they can say this is son fronterizo because we're start adding our own feeling our own swing to it and as you can see son jarocho and son cubano are totally related because they have the same roots but then they have a little bit of uh, variety and and that's what creates son jarocho and that's I think that's that's um the, the simplest uh, explanation I can give you, but um, Arturo, you probably want to add to that. Well, the, we, we love to fix dates and places to things. And I just find that that doesn't, doesn't do the job. So the, the, the legend is that the uh, son Cubano, the, what we call son, was really part of a tradition in Oriente, in Santiago. And the, the practitioners of that uh, tradition were a, a particular family named the Varela family. But here's what I think really happened. I think that wherever enslaved peoples were brought to the new world, they brought with them sounds that influenced heavily the sound that was part of that world anyway. And so they, of course, there's gonna be a relationship with between Veracruz and Cuba. They're very close, first of all. Second of all, there's a much commerce between those two places over centuries. And so the music that 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 and and the music that I discovered that my music Son Cubano I recognized that in the music of Veracruz and you saw that Jorge when we went to Cuba, me and Jorge went to Havana to play and we discovered and we took Tacho, and Tacho sat across the stage from Coto who's one of the world's great treceros, and they started playing together, and man it was like a homecoming, people started crying. Because it was, again, it was a reconnection of something that never was really, really, really separated except by concept. This is this and this is that. And never the twain shall meet. When in point of fact, the music that is such beautiful music from Son, the Son Jarocho music and the Son Cubano music is born from the same streams. It just, and it doesn't dilute that it comes from the same streams because the in the hands of a Veracruzan musician and in the hands of a Cuban musician, it's realized in a different way. But there's such 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 similar roots and such similar, uh, 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 it, you know, it it. So we need to be careful because the music that is Cuban is also like music from uh, Veracruz. It's from all over the world, but you need Cuban. That's true. That's true. That also, um, you know, brings us to the whole connect the, the whole connectivity of music of the power of music, music being 
connecting us from all over parts of the world. And maybe that's part of the whole power of what happens at the border and the way that that border barrier gets transformed. Because the music, it transcends. It transcends any you know, definition. It's beyond language. Thanks for that. We have a new, we have a follow up question from Donato Cabrera. Uh, this is for Arturo. How did Arturo discover Son Jarocho? I was born in Mexico. Um, my entire family is Mexican, and as uh, my if you saw my mother, you would swear she was from Veracruz. Um, uh, my people ended up all over Mexico. I grew up with the sounds of Son Jarocho. I grew up with the sounds of Mexico. I grew up with mariachi and banda and North Tech. I grew up with those sounds. I don't, I don't know how much I discovered to Lovato, but it sure discovered me. And 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 that music rang the second I heard the music of of, of, of Ramon and Patricio and Tacho. That 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 was like a, 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 it was electric. It was like an alarm going in me of recognition that that you know. And then, of course, I, I didn't know uh, Patricio and Ramon specifically, but that sound is a part of my youth and a part of my life and part of my heart. Thank you, Arturo. Um, throughout my discussions with different documentary filmmakers uh, throughout the festival, I've learned some new terms, one of them being uh, this idea of extractive filmmaking, where filmmakers go to an area tell a story and then leave and not contribute much. That doesn't seem to be the case with this documentary, which seems to be so authentically told and so constructed in community with the musicians, with the people of Veracruz, with the people of, of the Tijuana US border. Um, tell us a little bit about this process of making this documentary as authentic as, as possible. Well, I mean, I think a lot of it is in the intention. I, I see everyone who's in the film and behind the camera. We're all collaborators. We're, you know, we're all, you know, I mean, like the Sonorata musicians and Arturo, you know, Kabir and Jorge, I mean, they're, they're way beyond me. I mean, they're, they're truly masterful at what they do. And they're all peers. I'm not, no, no one was going anywhere to find someone to kind of, you know, look down on and film, you know, from up above, like we're somehow superior and, you know, we, you know, found you. There's, there's nothing like that. It's, it's, it's actually contrary, it's the exact opposite. And so I think that, you know, we all have made this film together and we're all going to be lifelong friends after this. I mean, this has been such an intimate experience. You know, we, I'm, it's, you know, I talk with Jorge, I talk with, you know, Tato and Wendy and connect with Ramon and Fernando. And, you know, this is an ongoing conversation. This isn't like we went there and we were left and, you know, and now they're going to continue performing and they just did a Birdland concert together. So this is not, this is an ongoing conversation. Also, I'm really hoping, I mentioned this to Ramon yesterday, that the film is going to call more attention to them and their music and that they'll have more opportunities, you know, to perform, they'll be invited places and, you know, so this is, this is, the, this is the, the Fandango Fronteriso basically expanding out into the world is what this is. It's, it's a continuation, or it's an amplification and a continuation of the Fandango Fronteriso and including more and more and more people in it. Thank you, Varda. Uh, Kabir, did you have something, something to add? Varda did a great job um, in in uh, capturing that and and uh, bringing this collaborative spirit. Um, we even did post production in Mexico City um, with the Namita, and um, it was really a true binational uh, collaboration. And there were um, consulates involved trying to help with with uh, documents and and uh, mo moving equipment. And so we it was really an immersive process. Um, you're absolutely right that friends for life. BFFs for life, um, but also, but also, once you're invited into the Fandango, it's like you're part of this community. And I think for people watching at home, just type in San Jarocho in the, in the town that you're living in, and you might find, especially in San Diego, we know there's a, a Jarocho community. But even here in Atlanta, I was uh, screening the film at the at the consulate here, and 
there was a bunch of Harochas that showed up in Atlanta uh, for the screening. And so there's there's this diaspora of, uh, that I feel like once you're in, you're in. And, and as Jorge said earlier, I thought it was a good point. I wish we had said this maybe in the film that uh, there's no one, there's no one, there's no ticket to buy to go to a Fandango. You just kind of just show up and you're just part of it. And that wall between audience and uh, artist is, there's not a wall. In fact, you know, there's just a Fandango at the wall. So. <laughs> One thing, one thing yeah, I, would, right. thing I could, uh, would like to add is that um, uh, people will see that uh, these fandangos happen all over the world. And um, once you take the fandango out of Veracruz, they all tend to be a little bit different, but they all have the same root. And uh, earlier we were asked the question, I think, by Manuel um, earlier that um, uh, how did this... Uh, or this idea came out about doing this Fandango at the border in Tijuana. And I think uh, uh, they get, uh, the context of the Fandango changes depending on where you are. And Tijuana, for all of us that live on the border, like uh, Moses, you live in San Diego, correct? And I think uh, most of us that live in, in this border, Tijuana is probably one of the, or the most cosmopolitan city in Mexico, where you have more people from all over the world coming, all kinds of music comes to Tijuana. It's a really a moving city. It's always jumping. The city has a lot of activity. And um, when I when I saw the opportunity of putting jazz and, and Son Jarocho together, I couldn't resist um, the the opportunity, and I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was it was going to be a beautiful thing. And, you know, it's it's a it's a one time opportunity. We don't know when we'll be able to to do this again. I know it costs a lot of money, but to to have this one time opportunity to bring the a full orchestra, to bring uh, Regina Carter, to bring uh, Kua Dixon, to bring Antonio Sanchez, to bring uh, Rahim from Iraq and and Saba from Iran. I don't know when we'll be able to do this. And the Villalobos brothers. And the Villalobos brothers and Patricio, Ramon, Tacho, Wendy, put them all together at the fence. I don't think we'll, I don't know. I don't, I don't think I'll see that in my lifetime again, but, uh, but it's a, it was a great opportunity. And I thought it was, it would be perfect for Tijuana and for our border. Thank you, Jorge. We have a, a new question. Oh, our friend Manuel is back. <laughs> I was present during the filming and it was a wonderful musical and cultural experience. Do Arturo and Jorge plan to continue working or uh, to make a recording together? Unequivocally, yes. First of all, we've talked we've we've talked about this. We're gonna have the team. Kavir's gonna play the Leona. Uh, we're gonna teach. Uh, we're gonna teach Farda how to play the Quijada. <laughs> and uh, we're going to pitch the idea to uh, Luna Records and tour. You know what? Me and Jorge have spoken about this is really a serious dream of ours. Me and Jorge have fantasized about this for a long time. We want to go and take this beautiful family to the demilitarized zone. We want to take this beautiful family to the Palestinian Israeli border. We want to take this beautiful family to Guantanamo Bay. We want to take Pakistan. this beautiful family. India, Pakistan. We want to take this beautiful family, which at this point, because of the pandemic, we could also play the Canadian American border too. But we want to take this music and this experiment, this rekindling of rediscovered uh, paths. We want to take this as far as we can. And I don't know how, as Jorge said, it's very expensive, but you know what? The, the way that these things work is you get this crash and then there's rivulets and then they <laughs> spread out, right? And then little projects here, little projects there. And before you know it, it's it's it. People are playing this music, and they're playing, and they're mixing it up, and they're having a great time. In fact, I think Raheem and uh, Saba were performing and touring together yeah. and playing. Yeah. So there's been that's one of the rivulets, as Arturo has mentioned. Um, but yeah, we're down to make more music. So yeah, and I mean the significance of Raheem and Saba playing is that they come from two countries that you know consider themselves enemies. And here they are playing together. So and and Varda, uh, maybe maybe speak about that real quick on the film, uh, Fandango of the Wall. Like, how, how did you think about including? I know there were some conversations about whether to include or not these two stories of Raheem and, and Sabas. Why did you end up including them? 
Um, because we felt we really wanted, to, first of all, the original intention, you know, was to have them be part of it and they were there. And I thought, you know, that music that came from all of you playing together was just so exquisite. Um, but more, more to the point that we wanted to show through their story that this, these issues of the border and issues of people having conflict at borders, um, you know, are universal. They're global. You know, that this story is a universal story. While it's so specific to Mexico, and you know, we've got Veracruz and Tijuana and New York, and you know, the very specific choices being made. This story also has a universal aspect to it, and I thought that having them and hearing their story, you know, takes us, gives us that sense and understanding. And and I can I can add to that question uh, that Manuel asked uh, um, about uh, doing more things with Arturo, and and like Arturo said, we we uh, on our first day when we met in Tijuana when he came to visit me. And we were talking about this. We were we were just uh, brainstorming, and I was going crazy. Oh, Arturo, we uh, we can do this, and he's like, yeah, let's do this. Let's bring this. Let's bring the fandango to the world. It's, but you know, we didn't have nothing then, and and then we had a, an album. Then we had a book. Then we have a concert, and now we have a film. So who knows? I mean, this is the next step. Where do we go from this? Maybe the film will help us because the world is going to hear about this story. Hopefully they'll be interested in doing something like that and, and we'll be glad to join. Even even, even in in, a, in Baja California, I just got a letter today as, as we're talking. I, I, I was reading this, reading this letter a few minutes before uh, this meeting from a friend from um, the Mexicali that she's um, experiencing a new wall being built by um, Trump in that area where um, the um, Kumeyaay community, which is a Native American community, and and this wall is being built where they bring their kids to pray, where they bring their families to get together. So there's a huge uh, re rejection against that. So they were inviting us to go and perform there. So I was like, "Hey, that's beautiful. Let's. I, I, I'm gonna. I haven't responded to them, but that sounds like a, you know, it's the same thing. We can go anywhere where this happens, you know. And like Arturo said, Korea, South Korea. One time I was talking to Kabir. We were talking about India and Pakistan. Same thing, you know. They they can. We can get together and and share this message. The message of the Fandango, bringing people together. Hopefully." Is there an international rollout of the film planned? I know that maybe COVID-19 put maybe a pause on international distribution, but are there plans to screen the film abroad or has it screened abroad at other virtual film festivals or in person? It was, Fandango the Wall was part of the Ischia Film Festival in Italy. Um, is a sneak, uh, sneak peek, uh, work in progress. Um, but we have, um, I don't know, there's a long list. I gotta go look at the list. Maybe Vardy can give me an update because the pandemic has really scrambled the plan. So I'm not I'm not quite sure where, where I am and where we're going. But I will say that um, uh, yes to all the above. Vardy, you wanna give a, a quick se sense of, so the HBO broadcast, just so you know, is, is just for the US. So we certainly are exploring uh, international distribution options and we can't wait to bring this to the Latin American world. Um, but just sort of one thing at a time. Uh, but it is very high on the list <laughs> and we, we will get to it as, as, as soon as possible. Far yeah, after. We, we were just talking about it. So it's definitely on our minds. Yeah. And and, and also Jorge and I took the uh, Fandango to, uh, of all places, the south of France, which was very difficult. Um, to, and we did an Eiffel, we did a Fandango with the Eiffel Tower for 12 hours, starting at 10, um, at 10 p.m., ending at 10 a.m. or something like that, and so it was just—it just so happened that while we were there, there was a community of Hirochos that were gathering at the Eiffel Tower from across Europe. You can't make this up, and so we just showed up and we took over a, a, a metro car in the uh, Paris subway, and we had about 30 of us playing um, San Hirocho music. Remember that, Jorge? Yeah. And <laughs> and, uh, and we had bottle boxes of boxed wine and like Doritos, and we were playing all night. So. 
Where is the inter- footage? Where's the footage of this? Yeah, it's on my camera, on my Instagram. <laughs> okay. That that's so far has been the international distribution of this project. <laughs> yeah, it was it was fantastic. Uh, it was fantastic. It was a great experience to be able to join the friends of uh, France and Europe and 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 be part of this fandango at the Eiffel Tower. And uh, incredible, incredible. I mean, we we were there like. A, Kabir said for 12 hours singing and dancing and and, and Jorge uh, maybe mention with, Mo- uh, with the Moises about um, about uh, the plan to, to screen this in Boca San Miguel. Oh yes, yes. Okay, that's uh, our our plan. Also, uh, once the pandemic is over and and you know traveling, it's more open and we would like to go back to Veracruz and next year. Don Mr. Vega and Don Andres Vega is going to turn in uh, turn 90, 90 years old. So we would love to give him as a gift to go back to his house and in his backyard to show the documentary and have a fandango for him at the at his house. So hopefully, and it's a nice nice farm yard. So it's not 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 like a house like we have in in Tijuana or San Diego. It's a, it's yeah. a farm yard. It's beautiful. Right yeah, next to the river. Um, and you know what? And we have a Spanish, you know, speaking. Ver- we have a version that's subtitled. The English is subtitled to Spanish. So we we're, we're ready to go with the film. It's just a matter of. Oh know, wow, that's great. We've had our hands full. But, I uh, bet. <laughs> um, I threw this comment on a few minutes ago, but I think your Oscar campaign got started by Jose Quirino. <laughs> Oscar contender. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jose. Um, with the, I guess, with the HBO rollout, what has been the response? Uh, so, I guess it was just yesterday, so you might not have an idea. But any feedback that you've gotten from people who've been seeing the film? I um, early buzz has been, I mean, yes, very strong. Um, I screened it at my neighbor's uh, just a few hours ago, and uh, I asked what the feedback was, and it took you know, over a minute for my neighbor to gather himself with how just touched he was with the film and how emotional he was. And you'll see the responses. We're getting some great re- responses on Twitter with tears of joy. And someone said this earlier, it may have been, may have been Doug, that um, there is a responsibility also on filmmakers of, of sharing, you know, we often talk about the, the, the politics of Mexico and the stories we hear about the drugs, the violence, but that's also portrayals that filmmakers take on. And this is sort of like, maybe Vardy, you can speak about this, about like your role as a filmmaker and go ahead. Well, that's what I was saying earlier about being respectful to the character, you know, to who we portray. Because, um, you know, we, we are both reflecting the world in the stories we tell and we're also creating it. And I do believe that the, what you put your, your attention to and what you're constantly repeating, that it's, it's generating it. Yeah. And it's also very diminishing to the, commu- you know, to the people who are, you know, of that community. And they just keep seeing themselves as drug cartel people and, you know, violent people and, you know, just over and over the same imagery. Yeah. And it's false. So I'm, I do think we have a responsibility as filmmakers to... I just want to ask Jorge, what, what is the response of the, of the, and I think I just want the audience to know, of the San Jorge artists to the film? I want them, the audience to know how they feel about the film, Jorge. Well, uh, that's a, uh, a good one because um, uh, it just started like uh, Moses was asking me. It was just started yesterday, but uh, uh, this morning uh, I opened my, my phone and then I turn on my phone and I see all this like 25 messages about the film and the, most of them from friends that say oh the film is so beautiful so wonderful i can't believe i was crying i was i was so happy to see it it was so emotional so so far nothing but but nice comments really it's yeah. been really great i don't know arturo you were going to say something i think i yeah, no, I, I, yeah no just i want to say something that that, that 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 always occurs to me we hear a lot about what american filmmakers portray Mexico as or the sensational journalism that uh, portrays Mexico as a narco traffic to hell. But I think we're just kind of obsessed with that view. I think sometimes we don't think about the way the Latin America perceives us. 
with our NRA and our shootings and our lone shooters and the, the, the violence in our nation that's taking part right now is, is, is not understood by people in Latin America. I mean, I know for a fact that they don't understand shooting children. They don't understand uh, the, the kinds of, of, of mass shooter situations that we have. And so it's, 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 not, it's not quid pro quo. That's not the point. The point is that, the, the point is, is that you know, we need, to, we, need to, we need to understand that Mexico is also portrayed in media as a yeah. place of great beauty and a place of great distinction and grace. Archer, what is your friends? What are your friends and family saying about the project after watching it? What's the feedback you're getting? My sister wanted to know why she wasn't in it. First of all, <laughs> I tried to. She was always asking me if I haven't written a piece for her too. Um, <laughs> she was crying, bro. You know that. She was crying. Her family and friends were crying. My folks were crying. My my colleagues were crying. They all cannot believe uh, how touching and, and marvelously interwoven this movie is into the lives of the people that it portrays. And I think that is really the touching part of it. Is it, it from the from the camera work to the telling of the story, you really do, you're interwoven into the lives of some really beautiful people. And if that doesn't touch you, you better check if you have a pulse. I can, Thank I you, Arturo. Add, if, if I yeah, can right add, over. just one, one thing is that, I um, I got a couple of phone calls um, and one message saying that um, it was so beautiful. I sent this to some people in Colombia and they were saying, oh, this is so beautiful. I can't believe Veracruz is so beautiful. This music was so beautiful. So so it was a really nice, nice um, comments about the, the landscape uh, of, the, of the movie and also how how it was described in Mexico, how it was described in other places, and and I think that was great. And um, also the the a friend of mine from Mexico City, who is the organizer of a, one of the biggest festivals of Son Jarocho, um, uh, Eduardo Lizalde, he called me today and said, "Man, this film is so powerful. It's gonna make everybody jump in the Son Jarocho scene." So that was. I was great to hear that. I was so happy to hear that. So, because he's he's a he's a a guy that organizes this festival in Mexico City every year, and he knows about this. So, and he knows about filmmaking. So when when he saw the film today, and he called me immediately and spent like an hour talking to me about this everything that he saw, and I was very very impacted by that. Well, also, I do want to say, uh, um, you know, Ramon contacted me and just, you know, sent love and he's so happy and grateful and it was such a wonderful experience. Patricio sent me a note and sent me love and expressed, you know, gratitude and, you know, I, and it's a mutual love. And, uh, you know, Tacho and Wendy made a little video, you know, and sent love. And so, you know, this is, it, it, it's a mutually, you know, joyous experience it's thank i appreciate hearing your feedback so much uh we're nearing the end of our allotted time for this q a um i guess maybe if you can leave some parting words with our listeners and maybe my cue for that would be um if each of you could share what you hope people walk away with after watching the film whether it's a message or a call to action what do you hope people feel after they finish Fenango at the wall. Um, whoever wants to start. Varda, start us off. Really? Can I, I like hear, listening to you guys. I love hearing, I love seeing the film through everyone's eyes. That, okay. That's a joyous experience. Kavir, you go first. Uh, well, I'll say, I hope people will watch the film on HBO, HBO Max, uh, and also go to IMDb and rate the film, because I hear that's important. <laughs> and also send um, fan mail to um, Varda via our social media accounts. We're on Facebook and the Instagram Cracker. Um, so find us on these on the socials. And uh, please send us your feedback. We love to hear feedback. We're responsive. And uh, just reach out to us. Thanks for thanks for asking. Over to you, um, Marsha Brady Arturo. Marsha Brady. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know my locks looked. My locks look so odd. 
down there. <laughs> um, you know, I have a secret desire for this film. Besides the fact that I wanted to uh, uh, do so many wonderful things, I also feel like sometimes in the United States, Latinos are, are not the dominant culture. And sometimes that it's easy to confuse the way a dominant culture uh, associates you. And, and, and you tend to you t tend to be browbeaten and downbeaten. I'm hoping that Latinos in the United States get this movie, get to see it, and feel really accomplished and feel really feel really special that they brought so much culture to the world. I want them to be like super proud of who we are and what we bring. That that would be my secret wish for this film. Fantastic. It's not a secret anymore. <laughs> yeah, I did learn. Jorge, do you want to go next? <laughs> <laughs> I blurted it out. Darn it. <laughs> what was that, Jorge? Sorry. Okay, sorry. Thanks for thanks to the world from the words from Manuel uh, Camberos. I think he was uh, saying uh, congratulations. Thank you, Manuel. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for your support, and I hope you enjoyed the film. And uh, to me, I I uh, I mean, being part of the of the local community from San Diego and Tijuana, and what this binational community can share with um, everybody. I think it's a, I feel really honored to be part of the San Diego Film Festival with this project and with uh, being part of this team. And um, hopefully we can do more music uh, for the border, for, for the world. And I hope everybody enjoys this film. And like Arturo said, I cannot say it better than him. Enjoy and be proud of what what this film brings to you as Mexican people, and and um, have fun. Thank you, All right, Varda. It's your turn. Okay. Um, first, I just want to say that you know I'm just so humbled to be a you know, part of this project, and I just really, really appreciate you guys so much. I love you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Varda. Me también. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Mois, thank you so much for being so supportive and having our film be part of your festival and doing this panel for us um, and for the film to help get the word out. And my, my hope for the film has already been realized. It was today when we were doing the panel earlier and there was a young woman um, who watched the film and she said she was crying the whole time and she just felt like, you know, she was just so grateful and felt so relieved to see herself being represented in this way. And to me, that was, that was it. I mean, she was just so happy, you know, and just to see that and to, to hear that, that that's enough right there. Thank you, Varda, for, for sharing that. Um, sorry, and did anyone else want to say something? I or, if I may, I wanted to say this for the end because I think it's uh, the most important thing at the, at the same time. Uh, it's very important, probably not the most important, but it's very very important to me and to everybody. I want to thank and give a toast to all the people in Tijuana and San Diego, all mi, mis hermanos jaraneros y jaraneras, all the musicians that come to the fandango. If it wasn't for all of them, this is their fandango. This is our fandango. If it wasn't for all of them, we will not be here. So thank you so much. And this goes for all of you. Toda la banda, toda la raza. Tijuana. Tijuana y de México y nuestros maestros y hermanos de Veracruz. Thank you so much. Thank you. What a great, what a great, what a great place to, to end things. Thank you, Jorge, for that. Uh, so the film is available on HBO Max. Do you want to repeat again, HBO? HBO channel? Max is being broadcast on HBO channels as well, but you can watch it uh, streaming on demand on HBO Max right now. And, or you can watch it also at the San Diego Latino Film Festival tomorrow. Yes. So there's plenty <laughs> there, of options there to watch. First. Go there first. Actually, do whatever you like. <laughs> yeah, watch it wherever you want. The point is watch the movie. Um, Varda, Kavir, Arturo, Jorge, thank you so much for your time. Um, deeply honored to be able to screen this beautiful, beautiful movie. All the best on its rollout beyond HBO abroad. I hope every country gets to experience this wonderful gift of a movie. And um, 
Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Moses. Thank, Thank you for you. all your help. Thank you. See, see you Thank soon. Bye-bye.